Among the world's most colorful ports of call are Seychelles, Zanzibar, and Mombasa, remote but interesting landmarks in the history of ancient trade routes. Seychelles is a British possession composed of a group of small islands located about a thousand miles off the east coast of Africa. A few little dots of land in the Indian Ocean upon which live about 30,000 human beings, so far removed from the outside world that they have created a civilization of their own. Tradition associates Seychelles with the original Garden of Eden, but the recorded facts of history indicate that it was not visited by man until 1609. In that year, the crew of an English vessel seeking native trade explored the islands, but finding them entirely uninhabited, considered their visit in vain and sailed away. More than a century passed, and the peaceful little islands of Seychelles continue to exist free of human life would overrun with giant turtles and crocodiles. The advent of man as a colonizer did not begin until about the middle of the 18th century, when Seychelles was formally annexed to France. It was first colonized by French Creoles and African Negroes, and later by East Indians and a few British. As a result of this, the population of Seychelles today is a very colorful mixture. They are a natural, carefree, and happy people resorting to childlike celebrations on the slightest provocation. Although their islands were ceded to Great Britain by the Treaty of Paris over a century ago, the influence of their former French masters still reveals itself in their language, manners, and customs. In the matter of dress, they may be a generation or two behind the prevailing styles of Paris, but they take their clothes seriously, and nothing is of greater value to the well-dressed man than a high silk hat and a good pair of shoes. In spite of their extremely remote situation, it is interesting to observe that the great outside world has not lost commercial contact with them. Centuries ago, a Frenchman taught the natives a dance from the ballroom of Louis XIV, and the dance still goes on in Seychelles, where time is meaningless, and tropical and benevolent nature provides all that a reasonable man should need for his health and happiness. Such is the thought that we take with us as we leave Seychelles and continue our journey to the next port of call. In the historic harbor of Zanzibar, we are welcomed by the heir apparent, or son of His Highness, the Sultan of Zanzibar an Arab and a colorful character who personifies what is left of a glamorous throne that only a few centuries ago dominated all of Africa. The Sultanate is hereditary in an Arab family, and the present holder of the office is a man of great dignity and highly respected by his subjects. The palace of the Sultan, which was once looked upon with fear and trembling by the Negroes who passed it on their way to foreign bondage, and the administration building, headquarters of the British resident, are telling symbols of the present-day government, for Zanzibar is now a British protectorate. The city itself is a labyrinth of narrow streets, thronging with a picturesque conglomeration of Arabs, Negroes, and East Indians, the chief elements of the motley population. Zanzibar, the very name conjures up a thrilling history, unmatched by any other place in Africa. Being a natural gateway to the dark continent, it first became notorious as the great center of the East African slave trade. Through its portals once passed thousands upon thousands of unfortunate Negroes who were torn from their native homes in the interior of Africa and shipped as slaves to the so-called civilized world. The Arabs came first, and for over 500 years, they held undisputed power all along the east coast of Africa, with Zanzibar as the capital of their far-flung, loosely-knit Muslim dominion. Then came the Portuguese, who first made Zanzibar known to Europe in 1498. And from that time onward, the whole history of this part of the world has been one of blood and terror, begotten of incessant warfare between the various predatory races in their contest for the overlordship of the Dark Continent. And the primary cause of all this, which led to the devastation and depopulation of tremendous areas of square miles of unhappy Africa, and the wanton killing of vast herds of that noble and majestic animal, the elephant, 
was ivory. Unfortunately, the monarch of the African forest must die to yield his tusks. And here we are reminded of what is perhaps the most tragic chapter in the story of Africa. A chapter that begins with the elephant upon whose body grows the tusks of ivory that arouse the greed of man. In the interior of the dark continent, there once roamed great herds of elephants, living in peace and unmolested until the civilized world suddenly awoke to the value of ivory, or white gold, as it was called. The Arab traders were the first to take advantage of the opportunity, and then began that prodigious slaughter of the elephants. It is reported that when the ivory trade was at its peak, over a hundred thousand elephants were killed annually for their precious tusks. The few herds of wild elephants that are now left in Africa have retreated into the most inaccessible and fever-ridden sections where they are making a last stand for the preservation of their species. Ivory, what crimes have been committed in thy name, wrote Stanley, the African explorer. Every tusk, piece, and scrap in the possession of an Arab trader has been steeped and dyed in blood. Every pound weight has cost the life of a man, woman, or child and every 20 tusks have been obtained at the price of a district with all its people, villages, and plantations. Mombasa, another old African landmark, once vied with Zanzibar in the ivory and slave trade, but now, like its former competitor, it is resigned to less exciting but more peaceful occupations. Even the Arabs, now shorn of their powerful dominion, seem content to renew their old trade which were in vogue long before the even tenor of their lives was upset by man's greed for ivory. The great event of a visit to Mombasa is the celebration which occurs once a year in honor of the Mohammedan feast of Ramadan. Practically every tribe in Eastern Africa is represented here with its special group of dancers. And the tribal distinctions are so definitely drawn that each tribe confines itself to its own circle and its own style of dancing. And this childlike festivity symbolizes the freedom of a people whose ancestors were only recently liberated from the chains of slavery and vindicates the infallible doctrine that all men were born to be free, if not equal. And it is with this thought that we most reluctantly say farewell to Africa's colorful ports of call.